It's not that we leave and get out of that, it's that he then starts using us as his agents of reconciliation. He starts using us to bring light into a dark and broken world, to bring hope back into a place of hopelessness, to bring peace into a place of strife and into a people of chaos and strife. Welcome to the Pax Christian Church Podcast. We are so glad you've joined us today, and we pray that this message speaks to you and encourages you and challenges you to live for Jesus with everything that you have. Stick around after the message. We'd love to find out how we can connect with you and be praying for you. Here's this week's message from our Sunday gathering. Um, we're going, we're finishing, we're actually not in Hebrews 11 anymore, but I want to transition out of it with the last couple verses. Um, as I do, I want to bring up the idea of what are you here for? What is the point of this? Why are we here? Why do we do church? Why were we saved? And what is the point? Uh, One thing I would often say uh, in student ministry, uh, which is probably an outdated reference, so with uh, some adults in the room, you're more likely to get this than a bunch of the kids. But um, you guys remember Star Trek? And, uh, you know, like they get into trouble or whatever, and they tap the little communicator on the chest and be like, all right, beam me up, Scotty, you know, and they get out of trouble, right? Like, and then usually that was the plot point is like, for whatever reason, that didn't work. It's like, those things never work anywhere. Why do they like maintain that technology? They're always stuck all over the place. They're like, we can't get out, Captain, you know? And so it, it never did. I mean, it worked, but um, not, not the way they needed it to all the time. But I feel like sometimes... We're sort of expecting halfway, not that we're going to like disappear, uh, but we almost expect that like, you know, okay, I got saved. That was the whole point. And now I like do a thing on Sundays. Like now I I come to church and I I rearrange my schedule so that Sunday morning's open. And that's my thing. Like I'm, I'm into it. Like, no, I'm, I'm here. I do the thing. I follow Jesus and I'm at church. And it's almost like, if that's all Jesus wanted from us, or for us, if that's all it meant to know him and to live for him, then I think probably what would happen instead is that as soon as you got saved, like as soon as you were like, all right, Jesus, I'm on the team, it would be like, all right, I, you know, I, I confess that I'm a sinner and I give my life to Jesus and Jesus died for me, so there, therefore, I call you Lord and Savior, amen, or, you know, it's like when you get baptized and you just like get baptized and you come up out of the water and like beat me up, Jesus, and you would just leave. And because you'd be delivered from this horrible, horrible place where, uh, you know, everybody's a sinner and they're all the worst. And that's not what happens. Why not? Because there's stuff for us to do here. There's a mission and a task. And even more, like, I don't think any of it, like, beyond this place actually looks like the way we picture it. Like, sorry to crush your dreams if you're pretty sure of this, but like, you will not be living in a city in the clouds at some point after this. Um, it, it's, it's different from that. But, um, I mean, it's good. But there, there's a plan for the, the whole point of the Bible. If you read the whole thing cover to cover, it's a restoration of what he started with. God created everything to be good. And then we messed it up. Well, it's our fault. And then he made a way for us to get out of that. But by getting out of that, it's not that we leave and get out of that. It's that he then starts using us as his agents of reconciliation. He starts using us to bring light into a dark and broken world, to bring hope back into a place of hopelessness, to bring peace into a place of strife and into a people of chaos and strife. That's part of what we, we've been reading about, and part of the reason we took so long in Hebrews 11, if you've been with us uh, for a while, we've been in Hebrews 11, like you probably have like worn ruts into your Bible at this point. If you're opening a, a physical Bible, there's like streaks on your front, like the Bible app is like, do you want to read anything else? Is it just that one over again? Um, but so we'll, we'll take you out of there, but let's start in Hebrews 11:39. Just to, to, to come back and, and kind of gather just a hair of momentum heading into where we're going to go. So we're going to start in Hebrews 11, 39, and we're going to read the first few verses. And it goes like this. These, talking about all the people we've been in this hall of faith, right? These, the, all, the, all the people that we've read about that, that lived by faith, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, 
so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Since then, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen. There are those who have gone before in faith and who are witness to the power of God and their lives are a testimony of God's grace. There are those who have gone before us and, 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 and as a witness, their role that all these who have gone before, they were all commended for their faith and having lived in faith and yet not received the fullness of the deliverance, not received the thing that's actually promised. They did not attain to salvation in Christ. They didn't know Jesus, the Messiah coming and, and bringing deliverance. They didn't get to that part. They died before that happened. Everyone mentioned in Hebrews 11 did not see the blessing that God had promised. They did not see the deliverance that God had promised. They saw momentary, temporary things that point forward to every time there was deliverance. Every time one of the judges came through and did the thing and delivered Israel for a minute from his enemies. Every time that one of the prophets followed through and delivered the word of God. Every time a king of Israel repented and, and turned back to God. Every time Mo the people followed Moses or, or, or one of the plagues happened, Happened, or, or every time somebody acted in faith and walked in faith, it was a glimpse of and, and, a, and a moving forward in the promise of what was to come in Christ. And their hopes, their testimony of life is given credence, is, is given value, is given purpose and, and completion as we follow that same example of walking in faith with the added bonus of we get to walk in the beginnings of the promise being fulfilled because Jesus has come. The Messiah, the Deliverer has come. The King has come. He has paid the penalty for all of our sin. We no longer have to offer sacrifice. We no longer have to struggle through it on our own. We no longer have to keep looking forward to one day when God will deliver. Now we're in the place where God has delivered and there will be a time now, the time between Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the grave and when he returns is an opportunity for us to tell everyone we can about this opportunity to have, that there is hope, that there is, that there is peace, that there is reconciliation with our creator, that there is a, a healing and a restoration of the brokenness in our world, that, that there is, there's a time limit. We don't have the, the ending time. If you watch somebody on the internet that tells you that they know when the time is happening, no, they don't. They're wrong. It's not then. Um, that they have not figured it out because Jesus said you wouldn't be able to figure it out. He didn't know. He said nobody knows except for the Father. So somebody who claims like, I know what's happening. It's next Tuesday. So I used to don't do that, okay? Don't be that person. Um, but as we follow all of them, as, as we follow in that example, as we walk in that same pattern of living by faith, the call is to fix our eyes on Jesus, to run to him with everything you have and to bring everyone you can. Like, man, let's go. That's, that's the race set before us. That's the thing. And so as we break this back down, Hebrews 12.1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So if we can go back to that first half of that verse, um, go, thank you, thank you. Um, the first part there, the thing it says is witnesses. And, I, and I've heard this like talked about where it's like, 
where who's who's looking at you right now and like you know be aware of like who's looking at you and, and maybe encouraging you and like okay but that's not what this is talking about what this is talking about the word witness in greek is martus m a r t y s does that sound anything like a word anybody might have heard before the word is martyr a martyr was a witness to what Christ had done or, and is doing in their lives, sometimes even to the point of death. It was somebody who, under no circumstances, was turning away from what they had seen and heard. It, was, it included everybody from somebody who was literally executed for their faith, even just to somebody who, it's the same word for in the Old Testament, when it talks about like a testimony or, or a case can only be brought on the, on the weight of the person bringing it and two or three witnesses to testify to what had actually happened that these people who have walked before us in faith, as we look back at the history of people walking according to God's will, the power of the Old Testament is not to find a bunch of rules to follow. It's to look at how God engaged with broken people and said, here's some boundaries, you ridiculous sheep who will not follow me. And the sheep who follow the right way are a testimony to the goodness and grace of God as they followed for a minute in the right direction. They, they testify and give testimony to the goodness of following God. Even when, as we read at the end of that last chapter, even when sometimes it led to miraculous deliverance and sometimes it led to horrendous death and defeat. And either way, God is good and their faithfulness, whether it worked out in a miraculous deliverance or in an absolute end of their life or, or things, their faithfulness walking through that is a testimony of the goodness of God regardless of the circumstance. And that hope is shown not to be in vain because we can look back and go, oh yeah, what they were hoping in was super legit because we see from this side, um, at this point, at this moment in history, we can look back and be like, you know, about 2,000 years ago, God came through on all those promises. Can't wait to see how the rest shake out. This is awesome. Since so many have gone before us to, to testify to God's grace, with that in mind, that we're not the first ones to do this, you're not, you know, it, it's, it's like the thing that they, they share with people now, like, um, I mean, let's be real, there's a massive mental health crisis, especially among young people in our, in our world, but even uh, among a lot of people like depression and anxiety and all of that stuff, like therapy. I mean, it's like everyone's like, go to therapy, do this. Like, like something's going on. Like everybody is struggling. So many people are struggling. And, oh, come back to that. Go back to that scripture. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to stay on that for a second. Thank you. Um, with, with, with this encouragement in mind that all these people have gone before us, we can know, man, you're not alone. But part of the, part of the goal in, or part of, part of the process of moving forward in that and living in this idea that like, oh, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one who's gone through this. So what do I do now? Well, two, two significant things that are going to keep you from being able to move forward that the writer of Hebrews points out right here as we get into it is the, uh, that we need to throw off everything that might hold us back and the sin that so easily entangles. The things that hinder us are not necessarily sin, but you can almost qualify it as that if it's going to keep you from running the race, if it's going to hold you back from it. Paul, the apostle, went so far as to say, recommend like, you know what, people, based on my experience, I would say it's probably better if you don't even get married. Like, it's hard to follow Jesus all the way and be married because you got like these other people to deal with. You have to take them into consideration. You can't just bail out and be like, well, I don't know, I think I'll go here next month. Like, what about them? How are they going to eat? Like, I had that experience, like, not about following Jesus, but, like, I played in a band for a minute, and, um, and it was going really cool, and they, had, like, had a professional EP out on, like, a real record label, and, like, I was starting to write some new stuff with them, and, like, it was really cool. And then they were like, hey, we're going to go on tour. And I was like, I'm going to go on tour. 
this is awesome. And then I didn't get to go because they were like, yeah, yeah, so here's the thing. We're probably not going to make any money. Any profit that we end up with from this tour is going to go into studio time for our next album. So, and I was like, wait, wait, so what am I signing up for here? Like, how will I come back from this? And they're like, well, I mean, like, you know, when you're on tour, like any money we get for each gig will then like feed us, pay for gas, lodging, and get us to the next space. And then hopefully there's even something left over from that, but we're not all like cashing out on that. It all goes into the thing. I'm like, oh, so yeah, I'm married and like I contribute to the bills. So what about that? Like, you'd be like, peace out, wife. Like, you're on your own for a while. I'll be back in three or four months-ish. And, and for a lot of other reasons, I'm glad I didn't end up going. But, like, that was a pretty good sign. Like, no, this is, this is hard. I can't just drop everything and go do this thing just with, like, the guarantee that, like, I will still eat probably every day. And I will have somewhere to sleep, you know, like the van or maybe even a hotel once in a while. And, like, that is not... I have other people whose lives, uh, I had somebody, one other person at the time, but I, I have somebody else that I have joined my life together with. And it's one thing if I like have to leave for a bit to do some stuff, but like I still have to contribute. Like I'm still also responsible for her. And Paul's like, that's hard. It's easier to just follow Jesus if you don't have somebody else to drag you along. Does that mean that none of us should be married and we should all like split up and like just go do things? Sing? No, but He acknowledges that, like, even a family could potentially be a hindrance. It is not a hindrance. Don't catch me wrong on that. But there's potential there that that could hold you back from really going all in with Jesus. And as somebody who's part of a family, whether, uh, you know, it's just you have parents, probably, or, um, uh, or it's, you know, a spouse or siblings or whatever, if you, or, or children, um, and or children, um, in life, what things might hinder you from following Jesus and looking at how can I, like if I've made a, a, a commitment to other human beings that rely on me, that I have, that I've promised that I'm part, I've made covenant with them, that I am part of their life and they are part of mine taking into consideration, not how do I abandon them and, you know, claim it's Jesus, I'm going to take off and do whatever. But how, how do we follow in a way that we are not being hindered by worldly concerns? How do we go to get, come together as a family like Mandy and I have been doing for 17 years now, a little more than that because we got more married, or I mean, we were talking about life together before we actually, you know, had the wedding. But, um, So we've been planning for like 18 years, you know, our life together and every decision going, how can we both make sure that our life choices are not selfishly holding back for our own interests, what God is actually calling us to do in our marriage and in our lives together as we are two lives joined as one in Christ, then what does that joint life between the two of us look like as we continue forward in him? And how do we throw off every hindrance? And at times that has looked like tossing out whatever job we had to pursue what Jesus was calling us to. That has looked like resigning from full-time work with benefits to go like, I don't know what comes next, but we're going this way because that's where God's calling us. We've done that a bunch of times, not just when we started PAX. We've done that several times. And every time it's been hard and every time it's been terrifying. And some of the time it's been like a whole lot of people going like, this is a bad idea. Don't do this. And we're like, yeah, but, you know, like in those moments, I kind of felt like Peter and John talking to the Sanhedrin. They're like, we just crucified Jesus. You need to stop talking about him or we will crucify you. And they're like, okay, but also we've seen like, we were with Jesus. We saw what he saw and did what he did and said. And now we're doing the things he told us to do. And the Holy Spirit is working. And we're seeing all this stuff. Like, we can't stop talking about this. Like, what do you think is better? Listen to you or God? Because, I mean, we're going to just keep doing this. Do what you want. What in your life, convenience, favorite football team, your, your job, your lifestyle, your significant other, your most favorite sin that you don't want to get rid of. 
or just stuff in your life that's holding you back. I mean, even just like, like I don't go to the, I'm not a gym rat or anything, but like it is in my mind a lot that like when I get up and, you know, like recently I've been trying to figure out stretching to deal with like my Achilles or something is like super tight a lot of the time. I'll get up in the morning and I can like barely walk. I feel like I'm about to like pop a tendon or something. It's crazy. And, and I just like feel like such a, like, yeah. I just, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes, I wasn't going to say that for, you know, those, the couple of people who are a, a year or two older than me in here. But yeah, I, I feel, but here's the thing. I don't mind the like aging part. I don't mind like I'm getting some grays and things. Like, I don't mind any of that. What I don't like is the idea of like this physical thing. If I have anything to say about it, I don't want it to be able to hold me back from doing the things that I'm called to do because it is super annoying when I want to go do something or I feel called to go do something and I don't feel like I have the strength or ability to go and do that thing. And it's one, like, and if that's something out of my control, it is what it is. But if I have the ability to speak into that, if I can stretch a little bit and be like, I, I can make that less of an issue in my life. I can do a few of these and, and some other things and like stay fit enough that I can go and do stuff with my family, that I can go and, and be out with some friends where we might talk about Jesus with people. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to the ski season coming back because I've got a couple of friends that we go out and we just like, we sing worship songs while we're riding through the powder and we get on the chairlift and talk to people. And I've got a couple of atheist friends and other people and agnostics and various things. Like we're talking to people about Jesus while we're up on the mountain. We're praying with people. We're finding people who fell and got hurt and we're stopping and praying and checking on them and, and in the name of Jesus. And, and, and it's awesome. And I don't want anything to hinder. Like I want to be able to do whatever it is that God puts in front of me and calls me to do. And I'm not saying you need to go start snowboarding so you can evangelize on the mountain, like, or whatever, but just like, what is it in your life that might be hindering lifestyle, uh, schedule choices, job choices, work choice, priorities? What's hindering you? It might not be overtly sinful, but if it's holding you back from what God is calling you to do, if you hear, man, Jesus is awesome. I want to follow him. I want to do these things. But this, whatever that but this may be considered, like, is that something I should lay down and walk away from so that I can run this race? You know, like if I was going to run a marathon today, I'd be like, man, I want to run, but like, boy, these jeans get chafy when you start running in them for a long time. Like, that's not cool. Maybe I should put on some like running shorts. You know, if I was going to run a marathon, these boots are not it. Like, I, they hurt enough after just walking, standing around in them for a day. You know, like by the end, I'm kind of like, oh, okay, my ankles are weird today now. Uh, too many years skateboarding and making my feet turn upside down, falling off of that thing. And, um, you know, if I was going to run a marathon right now, like the button up, that's not really it. Maybe even the hoodie. Like none of that's, like this isn't the outfit for that. If I need to run somewhere today, I need to throw off these things that would hinder me from being able to do that, right? Doesn't mean like I wore inappropriate clothing, but situationally, this would hinder me from God's call. I think it, it, we can't just like skip past that and be like, oh yeah, yeah, great cloud of witnesses, cool. Let's throw off everything. Okay, whatever, there's sin. No, I don't have too much sin in my life. I'll be okay. But then sin too is like a thing that, grows up and entangles us and snares us and traps us and trips us. It's, it's like running through a bunch of booby traps. I've been watching this ninja anime series with my kids and like the, the other day, yesterday we were watching an episode where they were like running through and there were all these booby traps everywhere and they're like tripping over stuff. And I was just, I was thinking about the message and like, I'm like, yeah, it's like that. You're just like running around and somebody put like a, you know, thin wire in the forest that you couldn't see because you're running full blast and it's like, you know, face plant. I'm like, what was that? Oh. I still have this sin that I'm like turning away from God. Like I'm not fully given over to him. I have not fully dedicated my life to it. I have this thing that is just this corruption, this cancer in my soul that is eating me alive from the inside out. Why? Why am I letting that continue to grow and develop instead of doing everything I can to carve that thing out and get rid of it so that I can run the race laid out before me and not be hindered by things that are disqualifying me. So let us run this race. If we throw off these things, the, the, the things that hinder us and the sin that so easily entangles us and holds us back, 
Then let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So that's the next half of that verse there. Let us run with perseverance. And this race marked out for us is what we're going to get to here. As we talk about fixing our eyes on Jesus, the way that we run this race with perseverance, the, the, if it says perseverance, I think it's probably a pretty key indicator that it's not an easy thing. You don't have to persevere through like a McDonald's meal. Maybe you do. But like <laughs> generally that's like, you know, or like your favorite ice cream or whatever your like favorite snack or treat is. Like, like I, uh, when we were on this trip, Somebody mentioned ice cream, and I'm like, yeah, let's get ice cream. And so we went, and I looked, and I, like, I found a pint of ice cream, and I was like, heck, yeah, I want that. I want this ice cream. And so I got the ice cream, and it was our last night. So there was nowhere to put the ice cream after that evening. And nobody else wanted that ice cream. I ate a pint of ice cream, people. Like, it's been a minute since I've had ice cream, so like, you know, it sort of balances out. Not really, I don't think. I'm pretty sure... Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure a couple of my shirts are tighter all of a sudden, you know, just from eating that last week. It was ridiculous. Um, I guess that's part of that, like, getting older thing. Like, you know, the, all of a sudden you hit that transition where it's like, what? I can't live on ice cream, pizza, and cereal anymore? How does that work? Uh, that affects my metabolism? Uh, but, yeah, so I ate a whole pint of ice cream. It was not difficult. I did not persevere. I was just, like, chilling eating ice cream. I was reading my Bible. I was studying this scripture, but I was just eating some ice cream. And then all of a sudden I was like scraping the bottom of the pint cup. And I was like, what? <laughs> what just happened? I think I blacked out. Like, I don't even know. Like, where, where did it? Did you? Ha, no, that was just me sitting here for an hour with ice cream. And it just, the whole pint went away. <sighs> Gosh, that's embarrassing to say. I'm sorry. Like, I, that, see, that's a bad idea. Like, you shouldn't probably, your body doesn't need a pint of ice cream in one sitting. Um, and I'm not trying to, like, shame you if you're into that, but also, like, it's probably unhealthy, like, for your stomach in general and your overall health beyond that. Um, I think that's too much of one thing to put in there. Um, <laughs> we are called to persevere, and it keeps talking about perseverance. Twice now we're going to read about how Jesus perseveres. Fix your eyes on Jesus as we persevere, as we look to the hard things, as we look at things that are difficult, if we get tripped up on, um, some of you can, can relate to this thing. Um, most of us have driven children in the room. You've not driven, but you will. But you might relate to this if you've ridden a bike, because I did this while I was on my bike. Um, uh, I was looking not like really where I was going, but like straight down kind of. And um, this is not, uh, actually, uh, one of my siblings did this even more, was looking down at their shadow while riding a bike and hit a tetherball pole. We were out of school. Ran into a tetherball pole because we were riding like this. And just, man, I almost broke my own glasses. That was a little, little too aggressive. Okay, um, but I mean, just like face plant into a tetherball pole at like full speed. Right? That's unhealthy for your life. Uh, the problem was that we weren't looking where they were going. We're looking back at the shadow. I've done that plenty of times. You ever notice, like, even on the road, like, you know, when you're learning to drive, right? You're driving along, and they tell you, like, don't look, like, straight down at the thing because you're going to drive right into that. Like, if you look down the road, you drive straight. But what do beginner drivers do? They're, like, staring at the lines going next to the car, trying to line it up exactly. And as they keep looking here, they're doing this the whole time, and the car is just, like, all over the place. And you're driving, and you're like, either that person's brand new at driving or they're drunk. Like, I can't tell which. Something bad is that, or they're on their phone. And so, like, something is not going right there because they're doing this all over the place because they're not looking where they're going. If we fix our eyes on Jesus, it helps us to get through and get to the place that we are headed. And so Hebrews 12, 2, as we say here, fix our eyes on, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. The pioneer of our faith. He's the one, and literally that word in Greek means prince or originator or founder. He, he's the one who blazes the trail, but he, he's also the one who created the idea of faith. He's the reason why there is faith, because there's him, and then we go, oh, I believe in him. I put my faith and my trust and my hope in him. And so by Faith in him. Can we have Hebrews 12, 2 up there? Um, 
So fixing our eyes on him, who is the pioneer, the beginner, the, the originator. You can see a, a pretty lengthy definition there. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's in the notes if you care about any of the Greek and that kind of thing. And then he's also the perfecter. And the word is related to things that are complete. Uh, telos, the, the, the wholeness of, of time and, and of everything. It's uh, teleotes. Uh, I said that wrong. So if you speak Greek um, fluently, you're welcome. That was atrocious. Um, but that's okay, because you don't speak Greek, and I don't speak Greek, and we don't need to. I know enough of it to study it a little bit. And, but it, it, it's about bringing things to perfection. And so he's the one, uh, the, in the Old Testament, there's an image used several times where it's like the Lord goes before and comes in behind. Jesus is the one who leads us on this path of faith. He is the destination of our faith. He's the one who established the road that we walk in faith. And he's the one who makes sure that we come to completion in that. As, as again, Paul writes that he, he will be sure to bring to completion. To, he's faithful to complete the work he has begun in you. Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. So in light of the sacrifice and, and the faithful walk of so many thousands of years back and those who have gone before us in this generation and even those who you might know right in this very building who maybe are even just like a few days or a few weeks or a year or two ahead of you on this journey of walking in Christ. And that's not a literal timeline always because let's be honest, there are some people who have been in church for a very long time and this day might even be the first time you're considering what it might look like to be a Christian beyond the chair you're sitting in. Being in church a long time does not make you a seasoned veteran of the faith. It could, but it doesn't guarantee that. Just like there was, a, there was an old, uh, what was it, a Model A that your grandparents had sitting rotting in the side yard of the house? There's a Model A car, like old school. Not like, I think that car is older than anybody in the room. And it was not kept up and good. It wasn't like this really impressive classic. I mean, it had some good bones to it. It had some, some good potential there. But it wasn't this like impressive, like, wow, you know, this is this, is this legacy of, uh, of time and road and, and upkeep and all of it. It, it had just kind of sat there. And I think sometimes we can get like that and just be like, I've been here a long time. Like, yeah. You know, some things when they sit there for a long time, they just sort of get soft and weird stuff starts growing on them. And, and I'm not trying to call anybody out in particular, but I'm just trying to challenge the idea that, like, maybe there's more to this. And as we look at the testimony of faith that so many who, throughout, if you really re go back and read Joshua and Judges, if you, if you read through the, old, the rest of the Old Testament, the, the testimonies of, uh, in Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, you read what the prophets say. So many times they keep pointing out to Israel, like, hey, just because you're God's chosen people doesn't mean you get to do what you want and get like a get out of hell free card all the time. That's not it. You're supposed to live as his ambassadors in this place. You are supposed to be the holy priesthood of believers to show the rest of the world what it looks like to follow the one true and living God. And when you get off track, it doesn't matter that like, but my ancestors, 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 like I can trace my lineage back to Abraham and I, Adam and everything else. And like, Great, but you are a horrible person. You are pooping on that legacy. Don't be like that. Time served is not an automatic guarantee of growth and development and righteousness. In light of those who actually did walk by faith, even those like Samson who hardly ever walked by faith and then had moments of just like, okay, I get it, repentance and turning back to God. By their example, when we see what it looks like and what didn't qualify and what did qualify as faith, as we've looked through all of that, in light of all of that, Run this race and persevere. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Eyes on the prize, right? Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the one who created, who wrote, who blazed the trail of our faith. He is the one who brings it to completion. And for the, he did this not just for any reason, not just because it was fun, because he was literally crucified. He was nailed to a cross. They put nails through his body to hold him to a cross that he would die. They executed him. 
And he willingly took that for us. For the joy set before him, he endured. The call to perseverance doesn't come from like, hey, come on, buck up, buck up. I don't know if you guys played sports, but if you did, I think... uh, for me, at least, I had a bunch of times where I sat there and thought, like, but you're not doing it. Quit yelling at me. Who's standing there all out of, cha- out of shape eating potato chips telling me I'm not working hard? I'm dying here. Like, I'm trying not to throw up. Like, I am so tired and exhausted and overworked. I can barely move and everything hurts. Yeah? I think most of the time those coaches have gone through that. Most of them actually do know how to play and have done these things before. They have gone before us and and lived that. Regardless, Jesus is not the guy who's never played. He's not the armchair quarterback going like, look, guys, if it were me, I would do it like this. And you're like, you have no idea how that works. Jesus has literally walked through it. He's faced every temptation that is known to man, and he suffered more because he didn't just suffer the pain of that moment on the cross. He took on the weight and penalty of every sin that humankind has ever lived out or thought of. The weight of all of that was on him, and he paid it all. When he says, endure, he endured more than you or I ever could. There is no pain or torture or torment or suffering on this earth that can compare to what Jesus has gone through. He calls to us to endure in this call from the place of having done it himself. And man, I heard somebody talking about it just the other day and they said, you know, in eternity, 800,000 years from now, if your whole life was suffering and you lived over 100 years, you're barely going to be able to fit that into the line of how long that's been. Eternity is a lot. This momentary suffering, Paul calls it, this light and momentary suffering, because in the span of eternity, even the absolute worst, most painful existence is so short. And on the other side of it, there's no death, there's no pain, there's no suffering, there's no tears, there's no sorrow. There's righteous rejoicing in the presence of God forever. For the joy set before him, Jesus, knowing that that's what he was bringing things back to, that he's reestablishing peace, that he's reestablishing wholeness, that he's bringing reconciliation and restoration. He, He endured the cross. He scorned its shame. It was literally a curse to be hung on a tree. He scorned its shame. And he sat down at completing that. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That means he attained to the highest thing. Like he is the one sitting at the right hand, the hand of power, the hand of, uh, of doing the, the right hand, you know, the saying right hand man. Like that comes from this idea of the person sitting at the right hand is the one who is the power behind the throne, the one who is the power on behalf of the throne, the one who is the authority of all of this. He sat back there after having given, that was his rightful spot. He gave it all up to stand in our place and to die on a cross after living a perfect life and facing every temptation and taking on the weight of all of our sin and dying and being buried and then rising from the dead and then passing that on to all of his disciples and saying, I will give you the Holy Spirit and I will empower you to do this thing. I will help you to run this race. You will not have to do it alone. And as you do those things, I will be with you. And for the joy of knowing what comes on the other side of that, that as you serve me, as you tell others about me, as you bring people into my kingdom, you are sealing their eternity with me forever. And for the joy of knowing what comes on the other side of it, he embraced the cross and he endured through it. So keep him in mind because the only way is through Christ. John 14, 6 says, Jesus is asked about how do we know how to get to the Father? How do we know how to get to where you're going? He's about to be crucified, and he's given the disciples like, okay, last things. They're going to come for me in a minute. I got to tell you some stuff. And he's telling them, and they're like, how, how are we going to be able to get there? And he goes, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross because there was no other way for any of us to get there. 
John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, right? That he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For the joy set before him of that eternal life and not perishing, Jesus endured the cross so that anyone who would listen to him would not be destroyed, but would be brought into him. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn us, but to save us. Our condemnation is already assured. And Jesus comes in and goes, erasing condemnation for anyone who's willing to sign up. Anyone want to come? Anyone? Free non, non-destruction bus headed this way. Come on, get on. All you got to do... Just give it all up. Lay it down. Hand it over to me. I got you. God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Like he literally prays forgiveness over the people that are mocking him and spitting on him while he's dying for their sins. There's an old punk rock song that I used to listen to that people sent me all sorts of weird Christian music when I first got saved because I listened to all sorts of like unholy metal and punk rock and, and just things that nobody wanted me to be listening to. And so they gave me everything from like DC talk, which I'm sorry, I understand they love Jesus, but I, I can't do it. And... Um, it's okay. It's just as some of us are more sanctified than others, it's all right. It's, I'm just kidding. But joking. Um, but uh, it's just not my jam. And that's okay. But a lot of people, like, they used to put out these posters of, like, if you like this, listen to this to, like, give you a Christian alternative. And I swear, all the people who made those posters have never actually heard any of the secular music they were trying to line up. Because um, it was like, love Megadeth, try Skillet. And I was like, no. Nah. Like, even Skillet's, like, hardest song doesn't even approach. Or it was, like, usually either Megadeth or Metallica. It was, like, try Skillet. And I'm, like, they're actually, like, rad Christian metal bands. Anyway, that's not the point. But <laughs> but there was an old punk rock song that talked about, and it was one of those, like, that song resonated with me. I didn't even like this band that much. But it, uh, there's just this one line when I think about this that, It says, my sin, the hand that held the hammer, that drove the nails through your skin. But someday I'll I'll figure this out. Someday I'll win. And then like the last verse of the song, it's like, he took my hand that held the hammer, that drove the nails through his skin, and he said, I win. And just like this, like for for the, the scorn and shame but the joy of undoing that and bringing us from a place of brokenness where we would even overtly reject the creator that made us in his image and called us to love him and offered us salvation and still was rejected and crucified by the people that should have known better. Consider him, keep him in mind. Be, just be, fix your eyes on Jesus. Consider him always who endured such opposition. You can put that one up. From sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We are to run with perseverance because Jesus endured. And he, he endured the cross and he endured opposition from sinners. So fix your eyes on Jesus. Keep him in mind as you run so that you too will be able to endure. If you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, you remember what he's done and you let the Holy Spirit give us the power to do this, we will be in empowered to follow him, and we will not grow weary. We will not lose heart because he will be strong in our weakness. And then we can run this race set out before us. And so as we wrap this up, as we prepare our hearts, as we consider, in a moment, we're going to take communion together. In a moment, we're going to, we're going to step into a, a time of celebrating and remembering and devoting ourselves to our God who has done this for us that we get to be a body and a family together because of what Jesus has done. It's a beautiful and powerful and supernatural thing. It's not just a bunch of people gathering in a club. If all you want to do is gather somewhere once in a while, once a week or whatever, like they have plenty of people that hang out at the sports bars. They have the Elks Club over there and all those kinds of, there are clubs and things that you can go and do and be around other people. But there is something supernatural that occurs when the God who, has, who always was, is, and will be sends his spirit to live within us and unite us together as the church, that is different from hanging out with a club on Sundays over some mutual interests. This isn't even about mutual interest. It's about the idea that we are all transformed by the spirit of God into new creations because of the sacrifice of Christ. That we are redeemed humans who have our eternity set with Yahweh, the creator God. And we can offer that to anyone else who will come with us. 
who devote their lives and hearts to Christ. And that is why we are here. That is the race set before us. It is not to endure and just like maintain church attendance pretty faithfully for the rest of our lives. It's not so that you can get your name on the back of a seat at some point. We don't do that here. Sorry. You're not going to get to purchase the bench or the new thing and have your name donated by blah, blah, blah. We're not going to do that either. Jesus said before he ascended into heaven, like right before, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. You will testify of what I have done by the power of the Holy Spirit. You will do that whether faced with opposition, whether you stand before kings, whether you stand in prison, whether you are threatened with execution or executed, which all of the disciples were executed, except for John. They tried a couple of times, it didn't take. And so then they exiled him. They gave up on it. They exiled him. And then according to the early church, writing about like what had happened kind of after all the Bible had been written, they said the general history of it is that John was finally let go from the island of Patmos and lived out his years as the pastor of the church of Ephesus. But that was after they tried to tar and feather him and boil him in oil, or they tried to boil him in oil and it didn't work. He survived. Yeah, not, not, not happily. <laughs> yes, out. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus, about to re- remember what we just read, because he did all of these things, he stood at the right hand, he came back and was seated at the right hand of the throne of God. From that place of absolute authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, I have instructions for you. If you call Jesus Lord, your king has a mission for you. Go and make disciples of every nation, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And you don't even have to do it alone. Surely I am with you always till the end of, very end of the age. These things that we are to teach, Matthew 22, 36 to 40. Teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Go make disciples. Bring people along on the journey. And as they come on the journey, when they're ready to sign up for the team, putting on the team uniform, signing the contract, baptism, Die to yourself, come up to new life in Christ. Identify with him. We're not literally going to drown you, don't worry. But you go into the water and you come up to new life in Christ. If you have not done that and you want to do that, tonight is your night. We will fill up the thing. We will put it probably outside. And you can be cold for a second and you'll survive. And it won't kill you or anything. Like you will totally live through it, except that spiritually you are saying, I'm willing to die to come up to new life in Christ. I am putting my life down and coming up to a new thing. And then to tell others of that thing, is to love your neighbors, to serve them and love them and show them the way of peace through Christ, peace with God for everyone through Christ, to share with them the the hope of the gospel. All the law and prophets hang on these two things. And Jesus said, if you love me, if you claim to love him, in John 14, again, when he's getting ready to leave, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. You claim to love Jesus. You claim to be a Christian. That means I love and follow Jesus. Follow his commands. His last commandment he left with everybody was, go teach everybody to do this. Make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey. And when that comes back around, that ultimately gets to a point where it's like, oh, no, I have to teach, make disciples and teach them. Like, what? Like, yeah, that's the whole thing. To, to bring it back, Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, since so many people have walked by faith in in front of us, where's Stephen? Come on up. We're gonna we're gonna take communion together. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, there are so many who testify to the power of the grace of God. Let us throw off everything that might hinder. Let us Throw off the sin that easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us share our faith if it means mocking or jeering, if it means prison, if it means death. Let us share our faith if it means awkwardness. Let us share our faith with the hope that we might seal 
we might participate in sealing somebody's eternal destination. That we might know somebody who was dead and now walks in life. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. Don't forget him. Consider him. That's what we're going to do in communion. We're going to consider him. We're going to keep our mind and our attention focused on him, that we would remember his sacrifice, so that when we look at him, we go, but Jesus, this is hard. He's like, yeah, I was crucified. And I told you, I called you to that. It's okay, I got you. This moment will pass but eternity comes after it. Where are you going and who are you bringing with you? So that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Keep him in mind. So go make disciples. Baptize them, teach them to obey. And if you don't know the gospel, I have it in the notes here. If somebody needs to hear this, it's this simple and this clear and this specific. It's an acronym. We ha I think we have a slide for it. To live and share the gospel of peace is our mission here at PAX. It's below Matthew 28. There you go. Perfect. God, our sins, paying everyone life. Six words, fairly easy to remember. The explanation of each of those. God created us to be with him. Our sin separates us from God. Sin cannot be removed by good deeds. You can't be good enough to no longer have the penalty of sin upon you. The wages of sin is death. We're going to move through those slides. So the next one is God created us to be with him. There you go. And then our sin separates us from God. Sin cannot be paid with good deeds. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose. No one else has ever paid for the price of sin. Only him. Everyone who believes in Jesus and in Jesus alone has life. And life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. And that is the hope that we share with those who do not know him. That is the call and the mission of all of us who know Christ. Everything else we do is part of that restoration, living with Christ now, being agents of that reconciliation here and now, hoping for that eternity that is sure to come. So we're going to have, have a, a minute here to uh, take communion. And, and I think last week I asked you to do it this way. And I, I'm going to ask of it again. There's gluten-free in like a double stacked cup. So if you need gluten-free, it's there. Pull the cups apart. The crackers in the bottom one. Juice is on top. The other ones, you flip it upside down, pull the cracker out, and then turn it back over and open the juice. Otherwise, if you open the juice first and turn it upside down, <laughs> physics, right? gravity. <clears throat> but what I want to ask of you is that you would come and gra come and get the elements, if you believe in Jesus as Lord, and, and get together with two or three other people and, and give yourself a second, because if somebody's here by themselves and you see them by themselves, grab them. Be like, hey, come take communion with us. And as, a, as a body together, as a, as a small group together, come and, and just pray with one another and, and, and receive these elements. This is the body and blood of Christ given for you and shed for you that you might be saved. We do this twice a week. If you're part of House Church, we do this again at House Church. You should be part of House Church. Come and be the church together throughout the week. This is, this is a, a consistent reminder and, and sacred act of devoting our hearts and our minds to Christ, keeping our eyes and our hearts fixed on him who went before us, who endured the cross for the joy of reconciliation with us. Mm -hmm. Quickly pray and thank God and then we'll release you to take communion together. <sighs> Father, you are good, thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done and what you offer us. Holy Spirit, fill us. Sanctify this moment and this time. Give us the power to know you and, and, and your resurrection. Lead us in the way that we should live. Give us the power to endure, to be your witnesses everywhere we go. Thank you that you've made a way through the cross for this to be, for us to be your body together. 
We lift this up in Jesus' name. Thanks for listening today. We hope this blessed you and that God spoke to you. We'd like to connect with you. You can find us at paxchristian.church and fill out the digital connect card or find us on social media as Pax Christian Church on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. If this message spoke to you today, would you consider sharing this message with someone? Maybe tell a neighbor or a friend. Maybe leave a review and let others know what this has done for you. May you be inspired and transformed by God's Spirit as you step out into this world to declare that there is peace with God for everybody through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ.